you experience a train failure in service, begin by thinking communication. Seems an odd thing to say, but think about it. The pressure will be on you to sort the problem out, and you can use all the help you can get. So communicate. Tell the signaler the symptoms of the failure and what you're proposing to do. The signaler will pass this information on to Fleet, and they're there to help you fix it. Stay in touch with the signaler throughout a failure situation. This will help to minimise delays and ensure that you get all the help you need. In this programme, we'll look at the principles and procedures for dealing with the most common faults and failures on the Class 455 electric multiple units operated by Southwest Trains. The Class 455s fall into three subclasses, the 57, 58 and 5900 series. The 5800 series represents the class standard, while the 5700 series differs only in the non-driving trailer vehicles which have been taken from older Class 508 units. The 5900 subclass is essentially the same as the 5800, but five units in this series are equipped with thyristor-controlled chopper traction equipment. Each unit is composed of four cars, a driving trailer, a non-driving trailer, a motor coach and another driving trailer. Each vehicle has two bogies and four axles, or wheel sets, and each vehicle has an A and a B end. The small arrow on the lower body panel denotes the A end of each vehicle, and below this arrow is wheel number one. The wheels number one to four on this side of the vehicle, and five to eight on the opposite side. As you can see from the graphic, each pair of vehicles within a four-car unit has its B end innermost, so the four-car configuration is A, B, B, A. Bogies can be identified by reference to the A or B end of the vehicle in question. Each of the four axles on the motor coach is driven by a nose-suspended traction motor, powering the axle via a reduction gear. The couplers on the nose ends of each unit are of the tight lock pattern. Class 455 units are gangway throughout, including at the cab ends. At each side of the cab end gangway, there is a main reservoir air flexible pipe with angle cock for connecting units in multiple. On one side, adjacent to the main reservoir pipe, there's an electrical control jumper, while on the other side, a jumper receptacle. Now let's look at the electrical equipment on a four-car unit starting with the power circuit. On each side of the outer end bogies, there are collector shoes. These shoes make contact with the conductor rail. A lead from each shoe is fed to a copper ribbon fuse, called a shoe fuse. From each shoe fuse, a cable is fed to a power junction box, and from here runs the powertrain line for the length of the unit. At the motor coach, connections are made via an equipment link to the line breakers and traction motors, also via the main auxiliary fuse to the auxiliary equipment such as the motor alternator, the compressors and train heating. The braking system employed on the Class 455 is the West Code or three-step brake. Pressure in the brake cylinders actuates wheel-mounted disc brakes on each axle. The units are also equipped with spring-operated parking brakes which require main reservoir air pressure to release. Now that we've looked at the general layout of the Class 455 unit, it's time to consider the procedures on your faults and failure cards. Let's begin with train fails to start. Check the DRA. Maybe you set it for a very good reason, a signal at danger. With the power controller in the off position, press the overload reset button on the desk. Now try taking power again. If the train still won't start, check that the line indicator is on and the motor alternator indicator light is illuminated. If they aren't, press the auxiliary set button and check that all the saloon lights come on. Is the brake fully released? 
If it is, check that the control positive MCB is set and that the blue door interlock light is illuminated. Now go to the control cupboard in the motor coach and check that the traction control MCB is set, the wheel slide MCB is set and that the equipment cutout switch is in the normal position. Is the orange WSP failure light on? If it is, move the WSP changeover switch to the bypass position. Now return to your driving cab and try for power. If the train still won't move, contact the signaller again and request that traffic be stopped on adjacent lines. Now you'll have to get down and walk back along the outside of the train to the motor coach. Check that the electrical equipment isolating cock is in the open position. Return to the leading cab and try for power again. If the fault persists, operate the traction interlock switch in this cab in accordance with the instructions in the safety appendix, section 19. If you still can't get power, Return the traction interlock switch to normal and try to move the train from another cab. If all fails, you'll require assistance. Control circuits to your driving cab are fed from the output of the motor alternator. If the cab is dead after opening the master switch or the master controller doesn't work, Check the motor alternator is running by checking the motor alternator indicator light is illuminated and that the main train lighting works and the cab fan runs. If the motor alternator isn't running, go to the motor coach, check that the fuse cupboard door is secure. This door is protected by a micro switch. Now go to the control cupboard and check that both the MA control and battery positive MCBs are set. If a single unit cannot be cut in, assistance will be required. If you can cut it in, but the motor alternator isn't running, the batteries will supply the control circuits for a limited time. However, the doors won't work, so detrain the passengers at the next station and work the train out of service. The headlight will be inoperative and you must restrict the speed to a maximum of 20 miles per hour. If the battery voltage drops, the unit will cut out and the brakes will apply. Assistance will then be required. If the line supply is lost while the power controller is open, move the controller to the off position. If the line supply is restored, wait a few moments before taking power again. If the line supply trips as soon as you open the power controller, you can be fairly sure it's your train that's causing the problem. Let the train coast to a suitable location if you can, then contact the signaller. You can try opening the equipment cutout switch located in the motor coach control cupboard. This will isolate problems with the motors, camshaft or line contactors, but it won't help if the problem is with the shoe gear or shoe leads. If you open the equipment cutout switch on a single unit, you'll need assistance. We'll look at shoe gear problems in a moment. However, if your train consists of two or more units in multiple, you'll first have to find out which unit is causing the problem by means of sequentially cutting out the equipment cutout switch on each unit, then trying for power. Once you've found which unit is defective, leave it cut out and proceed. Remember, when isolating an equipment cutout switch, if it results in more than 50% of the train's motors being isolated, you must follow the instructions published in the loading conditions for class 455. If the problem can't be rectified by isolating the equipment cutout switch, you'll need to get a traction current isolation, then paddle up and remove the shoe fuses on the defective unit. We'll look at how to do this in a moment. 
If the line supply is lost while your train is coasting, let the train run on to a suitable location while waiting for the current to be restored. If the current isn't restored, contact the signaller. In these circumstances, you'll need to paddle the unit up, then ask for the line supply to be restored again. If the line supply trips again, your train is not at fault. Remove the paddles and await instructions from the signaller. If the line supply holds, it's your train that's at fault. Paddle up again, remove all shoe fuses and request assistance. If you have units in multiple, you can find a good unit by lowering a shoe on each unit in turn. On the unit which trips the line supply, remove all shoe fuses. Let's look at the paddling up procedure. If necessary, obtain a traction current isolation and the blocking of adjacent or opposite running lines. Once you've obtained assurances that these things have been done, switch on the cab light and press the auxiliary's trip button on the unit in question. Check that the line indicator is now showing off and that the cab lights are out. Take two paddles from the cage in the vestibule and paddle up the shoes at this end. It's most important that you trip the auxiliaries. If a compressor started, for example, it could draw a severe arc. Now do the same at the back end. Check that every shoe on both sides of the unit is paddled up from the conductor rail. Press the auxiliary set button and check that the cab light comes on and that the line indicator is showing off. It's now safe to work on the unit. If the line indicator goes out every time you encounter a conductor rail gap, you've blown a shoe fuse on the unit. With a spare ribbon fuse and the shoe fuse spanner from the cage in the vestibule, you can renew the ruptured fuse. Once the shoe fuse has been renewed, remove all the paddles and stow them in their proper place before advising the signaller that adjacent or opposite running lines can be opened and the traction current restored if necessary. If any shoe gear on your unit becomes damaged, causing arcing and tripping of power supply, carry out the same procedure as you would for shoe fuse renewal before actually dealing with the damaged gear. If possible, try to run the defective shoe into a gap. When you locate the damaged shoe gear, begin by removing the adjacent shoe fuse. If the damage is to the shoe, the shoe arm or the shoe beam, saw off any broken parts, then tie the damaged equipment securely to the bogey structure. You'll find the necessary tools and rope in the emergency equipment cupboard. Make sure that both the shoe and the remains of the shoe arm and shoe beam are tied well clear of the conductor rail. If the shoe lead has been damaged, cut it away as close to the shoe fuse box as possible 
then use the insulating tape to fully cover any exposed copper conductor. If the H-frame itself has sustained damage, remove the shoe fuse, then, only if you've been trained, try to cut away and tie off the damaged part. If you can't, or if you haven't been trained, you'll need to request the attendance of fleet staff. After you've dealt with the damaged shoe gear, you can remove the paddles. Put any of the damaged gear you've cut away in the train, then request the restoration of the traction current. The train should now be worked out of service to a maintenance depot. If you experience low main reservoir air pressure and suspect that the compressors are not working, begin by checking that the line indicator is on and the motor alternator indicator is illuminated. If they aren't, press the auxiliary set button. Check that the compressors are now working. If they are not, you'll need to check the compressor control MCBs are set and the compressor cutout switches are normal in each cab. These are sealed. Now go to the control cupboard in the motor coach and check that the control supply MCB is set. Check that the fuse cupboard door is closed and locked. If one or other of the compressors is still not running, check, and if necessary, renew at least one compressor motor fuse. One compressor will be enough to get you on your way and you can renew any other blown compressor motor fuses when you reach your destination. If the compressors are running, but the main reservoir air pressure remains low, you'll need to check round the outside of the train for leaks. One of the most likely causes of a main reservoir leak is a burst or split flexible pipe between the vehicles. This leak can be isolated by closing the main reservoir yellow angle cock on both sides of the burst. Now, trip all the compressor synchronising MCBs on one side of the burst only, but don't operate the compressor isolating switch. If the burst is underneath one of the vehicles, you'll have to isolate the leak by closing each of these isolating cocks in turn. The sand supply isolating cock, where fitted, this action will render the sander on that coach inoperative, the pressure heating ventilation isolating cock, the door isolating cock. This will render the sliding doors inoperative on this vehicle. These doors must now be locked out of use as there will be no air pressure on the door piston to keep them closed. If the air suspension on one of the vehicles turns out to be the source of the burst, you'll have to close both air suspension isolating cocks. You can now proceed, but at a maximum speed of 45 miles per hour. Check the electrical equipment isolating cock if the burst is under the motor coach. If this turns out to be the source of the burst, you'll have to also isolate the equipment cutout switch. This will render the motor coach powerless, so if it's only a single unit, assistance will be required. If you're unable to release the brake, make sure that the master switch is in either forward or reverse and the DSD treadle is depressed. Check that the main reservoir air pressure is higher than 7 bars. Check that the AWS MCB is set on the panel behind you, resetting it if necessary. If it won't stand, you'll need to operate the AWS isolation flag in the second man's side window. Advise Southwest Trains Control 
so that arrangements can be made to take the train out of service. If the AWS MCB is set, check that the brake control MCB is also set. Now press and hold down the uncouple button for 5 seconds to ensure that the drum switch is in the correct uncouple position. Try moving the master switch to the off position, then back to forward. The AWS horn should sound. If it doesn't, again you may need to isolate the AWS. Make sure the doors are not released. Then check both sides of the train for any hazard lights illuminated. If one is illuminated, go to the vehicle in question and check the PASCOMs are set. Don't forget the PASCOMs in the vestibules behind the driving cabs. If the vehicle is a motor coach, also check the control supply MCB in the control cupboard. If no hazard lights are illuminated, you'll have to check the situation in the other cabs. Make sure the brake controller is not in the emergency position. Make sure the master switch is off. Make sure the emergency bypass switch has not been operated. Now check that the brake control MCB is set. Check that each of the drum switches is in the correct position. Up for coupled, down for uncoupled. In the intermediate cabs you'll need to check that the drum switches are in the couple position. Do this by putting your key on, moving the master switch to forward, then pressing the couple button for 5 seconds. Finally, in the back cab, Check that the drum switch is in the uncouple position by putting your key on, placing the master switch in the forward position, then pressing the uncouple button for 5 seconds. Now return to the leading cab, put your key on and place the master switch in the forward position. Set up the cab radio and place the brake controller in the release position. If the brake still won't release, Try isolating the AWS. If this doesn't cure the problem, you'll have to operate the emergency bypass switch and take the train out of service immediately. If the brake fails to fully release on any vehicle of your train, begin by making a Step 3 application. Now operate the parking brake application cock under the desk on the second man's side of the cab. Move the brake controller to the release position and ensure that the train does not move. More than one parking brake may be needed. On the outside of each vehicle in turn, close the brake isolating cock. If you hear escaping air, leave the cock in the isolated position. If not, reopen the brake isolating cock and move to the next vehicle. Once the defective brake has been isolated, return to the driving cab, select Step 3 and return the parking brake application cock to the normal position. Don't forget that you now have the brake completely isolated on one vehicle of the train, so you'll need to follow the regulations for isolation of brakes given in your Faults and Failure Handbook. If the sliding doors on the whole train will not release or open, ensure that the passengers are advised by the PA. Then begin by checking the Door Control 2 MCB in every driving cab. If the Door Control 2 MCB is tripping each time a door release is given, it probably means there is more than one key switch operative. If the fault persists, go to the control cupboard in the motor coach and check that the control supply and the auxiliary control MCBs are set. If you still can't get a door release, go to another position and try there. As a last resort, you'll have to detrain passengers 
by means of the external door emergency valves and take the train out of service. If the sliding doors won't release or open on a single vehicle, go to the environmental cupboard in that car and check that the door control 1 MCB is set. Check the doors in case they are locked or air pressure is holding them shut. Check that the internal door isolating cock, if fitted, has not been closed. Check the external door isolating cock hasn't been closed. If a single door won't open, begin by checking that it's not locked. Check that the internal emergency egress lever is in the normal position. If the door still can't be opened, lock it out of use. Attach an out of use label and inform all passengers via the public address. If the doors on the entire train fail to close when the door close button is operated, begin by checking the door control 2 MCB in each driving cab. In the control cupboard in the motor coach, check that the control supply MCB is set. If the fault persists, try closing the doors from another position. If you still can't close the sliding doors, you'll have to detrain the passengers. Then close the doors by means of the black buttons on the outside ends of each vehicle. Lock the doors and take the train out of service. If the train won't take power, you'll have to operate the traction interlock switch in the leading cab and follow the instructions in the safety appendix, section 19. If the doors fail to close on a single vehicle of your train, you can use the local door close button on the outside end of the car. If this won't work, try closing each door leaf manually, then locking them out of use. If a single door fails to close, check that the internal egress lever is in the normal position and that the door is free from obstruction. Now check that the external door valve is in the normal position. If the door still won't close, try closing each door leaf manually, then locking them out of use. If the door interlock light fails to illuminate after the doors have been closed and all hazard lights are out, check that the starting bell works and that traction power is available. If the starting bell doesn't work and power is unavailable, begin by checking that the brakes will release. Now check the control positive and door control 2 MCBs in the leading cab. If the fault persists, you'll have to check the door control 2 MCBs in all other cabs. Check the DCB1 MCBs in every environment cupboard. Finally, go back to the leading cab and operate the traction interlock switch. Once you've done this, physically check that all doors are held closed by air pressure, then tell the conductor to verbally give the signal to start the train by means of the cab-to-cab -cab communication system. Inform the signaller or controller. The train must be taken out of service at the next station where the entire length of the train can be accommodated. Finally, let's just look at the important procedure for reporting all faults. Begin by contacting the signaller either on the cab radio or by means of a telephone. Give your name, 
job title, employer, radio or telephone number, and your location. Check that you are speaking to the right person. Now give your train reporting number, followed by the unit and coach numbers where the fault has actually occurred. Give as much information about the fault as you can. Tell the signaller if you've already taken any remedial action, and if so, what it is that you've done. If you're going to berth the train, following withdrawal from service, give the location where the train will be left. Make sure you enter full details of the defect in the unit defect report book. Give a complete and accurate account of the defect and remember to give the actual vehicle number. Indicate whether it's A or B end and, in the case of wheels, axles or other running gear, give the wheel number if you can. If you experience any fault of the AWS equipment, you must also complete Form RT3185. Finally, if you're relieved by another driver, tell him or her exactly what the fault is, who you've told and what actions you've already taken. Don't forget, communication is of paramount importance. Let everybody know what's happening at your end and find out what's happening at theirs. Act efficiently and decisively to avoid or minimise delays. Lost minutes add up to lost money.